Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Brendan Hauser with Evoke Bike. We've got Scout Hollister on the podcast. You might know him from Instagram as Glute Doper Coach. He is a PT that works specifically with cyclists that have hip pain, back pain, knee pain. If you are riding in pain, we all know that sucks. It is a terrible, terrible feeling. And he has a really interesting points of why rest is not always the answer. And he goes into four pillars of function and what kind of goes on when they're not dialed. Motor control, stability, range of motion, endurance. It's a really interesting topic. It's one that I've been going through. If people know of my own injury, there's this one, I would call more of a little bit of a conversation. We don't really delve into my injury. I want to make this more generalized to help you guys get something and maybe resonate. So if you have an issue, you're like, oh, wait, that is what's going on with me. You can reach out to him and just start a conversation. Hey, am I a good candidate to do this virtually? Because he is a virtual PT. It's amazing. You do everything at home. You can get some gym stuff included. He kind of goes into that. But why is the solution to your injury also the answer to performance limitations? So it's not about just feeling better. It's being faster on the bike, which we all want to do. So Scout, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Everybody, good luck with your training and racing. Hit them up. Uh, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, please, if you're riding with pain or you have any little red flags, I made the mistake of ignoring them. Don't do that to yourself. You deserve better. Good luck. See ya. If you're doing PT online, how does this even work? And that was my first question when Tom jumped on with you guys. And I had obviously seen glue doper stuff. And yeah, so... You know, what I think what I'd love to do is intro. Who are you? Let's talk about the virtual piece real quick. And it's like, yeah. is, it, is it glutes? Is it knees? Is it back? And then jump into those four pillars. And if we run out of time, we can always pick back up with another one. But yeah, how does that sound to you? That sounds great, man. I can get started. I can do a little intro. Um, intro. Hit us. Who are you? Well, hit us with the intro. Yeah. My name is Scout. Um, there's more to it than that, though. No. Yeah, I'm <laughs> Scout. Um, I'm a PT student. So I'm a doctorate of physical therapy student. Um, for people that don't know, that degree became a doctorate level degree once upon a time so that we can do more clinical diagnoses. So for people who need direct access and don't always have like a doctor's referral, they'll go to a PT. And now we have the awesome responsibility of actually doing more differential diagnosis stuff. Um, and so that's where the degree became a three-year degree. And so I'm um, in year two or three of that. I also like racing bikes. I race bikes competitively as a Cat 1 um, amateur cyclist. And I think the most important thing about this whole thing is like I was a cyclist who was in pain and I needed mm. to find a solution to all this stuff. And so one of the reasons I'm so passionate about physical therapy and I'm in this pursuit of becoming a physical therapist is not only because I want to work in this field, but because I want to be the answer or I want to have the answers to a problem that people are currently going through because I was going through that very problem myself. And if you love racing, if you love riding like you do, like I do, like all of our athletes do, there's nothing worse in the world than not being able to go out and ride your bike because you're in pain. And so I went searching for solutions. Um, I found Dr. Tim Wu. He's a practicing physical therapist out of SoCal, um, like East LA area. He's the glute doper doc. And back in 2021, I became a client of his like, hey, help me, man. Um, and then he started teaching me things and I kind of became his mentee. He's my mentor. Um, and then now that I'm, I've worked with him for a while and I'm two years into this thing and I've been coaching athletes for two years myself, I'm now at a point where, yeah, we're, we're starting to really let the rubber hit the road and, and hit uh, lots of answers for people that have pain and they're trying to get out of pain. So that's long story short. I love that. So yeah. the 30-second answer to what was your problem? What did you have going on? So, okay, I'll try to do 30 seconds. My right knee is weird. I've had four surgeries on it, dislocated my patella and fractured it when I was 14 years old, was growing like five inches one summer. Thing grew back weird. Um, it has a like valgus knee shape to it, which is like a knock knee position. And so the quad, like the way the patella sits in the femur and the tibia and the quad would contract, it just wouldn't glide very well. So I have a weird right knee. It's a little bit shorter. But the funny thing is my, my good knee on the left side would just hurt all the time when I would ride. Mm. Um, and I just, I just ride and I, I'd have knee pain. A lot of people have it, just knee pain. Um, the fancy word for it is patellofemoral pain syndrome. But it kept me off the bike all of 2020 mostly, which was like the worst thing ever because 2020 was the best year just to go ride by yourself. So that's mm. what initially made me reach out to Tim. Um, and we can talk more about why like a surgery side or a, a side that has like more anatomical 
abnormalities or pathologies to it isn't actually always the side that's going to be um, the pain presenting side. But yeah, that that was my thing. Just knee pain, good old fashioned knee pain. Okay. And then, okay. That's so interesting. Yeah. So tell me about how did you guys decide to do this virtually? Because that is a huge question. I'm sure you guys get this quite often. And, and just in case people, maybe this is the first evoke podcast. Some people have heard. Um, I'm a cat one athlete. I have worked with Tom, who's one of our coaches who, when we did an evoke camp in Florida, where we just have riders come down to ride, he had mentioned that he was working with you guys. And I said, wait, you're working virtually. And the biggest problem that I think many cyclists have, and no offense to local PTs or other people, they don't understand what a 20 hour week is. They don't understand what 500 Watts is. They don't understand what you asked me today. What's four and a half hours at 270 Watts feels like they're so clueless. And that's yeah. not a knock. It's just, we have a very specific sport. So that's when I started a conversation with you because I'm like, Oh man, this guy, not only knows his stuff from the anatomical side of things and what I would as a lay person say, general PT, he's super bike specific. And the things that you give me transfer to the bike. So that's kind of my soapbox that I tell people. Yeah, I've now had three of my athletes come to you and they say, holy crap, I wish I knew about this guy three years ago. So kudos to you and what you're doing. It's frigging changing cyclist lives for sure, which has to feel good. But virtual i'm sorry i yes. digress with my uh appreciate my that preaching for you guys i'm just a huge fan so yeah, <laughs> yeah. virtual what's going what was tim always doing this or were you guys like hey we can reach more people with this and then i think the second question is how do you even assess people uh, through the computer yeah yeah so like what's the backstory what was the impetus and then does it work like it's cool that you guys mm -hmm. do it but does it does it work because i'm gonna be paying for this and i want to get better so it better work so the impetus for it was 2020 covid making it really hard to see people in line and what is it like scarcity breeds ingenuity i think is the saying in entrepreneurism like and i think that was totally the case for dr Wu. he wasn't able to see people in uh in person so we had to come up with a way to see them online um mm -hmm. and then building off of that like if we were to really think about why online service works so well it's great you touched on this and i didn't ask you to say this at all but you you capture it perfectly the local pt the person in your immediate area isn't always the best person to serve your needs. Like that's not a hard concept to understand. Like there's no reason your local PT is the best cycling physical therapist out there, but that's what we strive to be. And so the reason virtual is so effective is that it bridges the geographical bridge that limits people from coming and seeing us in person or receiving our services. Mm -hmm. And so then it comes, well, hopefully it's efficacious and the efficacy comes from we don't try to, well, let me take a step back here. I would say most people, and this goes into like our four pillars of, of human function. Most people don't arrive to us in need of service because they have a broken bone or a like traumatic mechanism of injury. They're dealing with us because they have chronic pain. And for the most part, it's pain that doesn't actually feel all that prominent when they're off the bike. It's pain when they're on the bike. So we've got a situation where Cyclists are in pain. You go get an x-ray, an MRI, CAT scan, whatever you want. Nothing's going to show up as being all that wrong with you. Yet you still have pain. Like you know it. You go for a ride and there's pain. So then it becomes how do we parse out the aspects of this athlete's function that is driving pain? We try to break it down into four pillars of limitation. And this isn't unique to us. Like physical therapists all across the country will be familiar with this. We just apply it more specifically to cyclists. It's endurance. Motor control, and motor control is kind of a fancy word. I like to think about it as mind-muscle connection. Like bodybuilders are really good at this. How well can they facilitate the connection with their nervous system to various muscles across the body? That's motor control. So we've got endurance, motor control, stability slash strength. Those can kind of work in hand. And then range of motion or joint mobility. And so then we say, okay, well, here, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add something for someone who's listening and they might, I, the motor control thing rings so loudly for me because I would always hear people say, oh, I am like activating my glutes. And you guys have, I think I saw a glute doper video years ago. I'm like activating glutes. I don't even know what, what does my glute feel like when it's activated? So now understanding that I should be able to at, literally work my glute and know what that feels like. I yeah. never understood that. And so I think of a cyclist out there, if you're thinking, I don't know what he's talking about when you're activating stuff you you might not have that mind muscle control and if you can go in on that later 
It's just something that I want to clarify for people because it confused me for years, especially, I don't know when that term really started coming out. Like let's activate before rise. I didn't hear that in 2010 as much. Maybe I just didn't hear it, but yeah, it just really was confusing to me, but it's so crucial. I'm now yeah. realizing. It, it continues to be crucial and it continues to be something that can seem super wishy-washy and kind of lame if used yeah. at a, not in the right context. Like I think I'm working in a clinic right now and I have athletes of, of all calibers, like older people, younger people across the board. And I'll ask them, are you feeling this? And I, I catch myself being like, is that the right thing to be asking them in that situation? So like it's limitation, it has limitations to it, but I still think there is definitive kind of black and white situations where an athlete can just not have the ability to connect with the muscle group. And then to establish that connection, whether it be pedaling strategy, some mental cueing to what you're using, or just like get back to the basics, get off the bike, go to the mat, establish it by repping it at a ton, the same way you get good at anything, and then go on the bike and you feel it. So yeah, that's a, that's a massive thing that a lot of athletes have to realize for the very first time, and it's not their fault. Um, it's not their fault at all. Bikes are weird that way. Mm, okay. So that's actually, let's go in then to, I think, another, the second question that I found very interesting, the difference between pain and being injured. And and I'm great at asking too many questions at once, but then why is rest rarely the answer to resolving the pain? Because when you told me I could still ride, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I love this guy. Oh, and the other thing is that I wanted to mention about the, local PT, um, just to kind of toot your horn here. Uh, when I had mentioned to you that I was going to go see a local PT in Florida, your response immediately was sounds great. How do, how can I best work with him? Like, what's he going to do? Hmm. And I wasn't sure if there was going to be friction there. And you were like, no, Hey man, like, it's great if someone can get their hands on you and they know what they're actually talking about. So I think kind of, as we talked about different things, someone might ask you, Hey, should I go to a chiropractor? And don't let me put words in your mouth. But when I asked you like, hey, it might help. One way to find out is go for a couple sessions and see how you feel. But I really liked the idea that you weren't like, no, this is my project. And so yeah. I think it's important for people to hear that also. Like you might have someone that's kind of helping you now get the bike focus stuff. Like it's and. Yeah, dude. It, I mean, my project in this whole thing is to get you better or the athlete better. That's my project. So whatever mm -hmm. level of involvement I need to have is only dependent on the one responding variable, which is, are you meeting your goals? Are you able to ride more? Are you able to live a higher quality of life? Like those are the things I, I only care about. And I don't know if that's, that perspective is more so from my personal background of having gone through like a long history of being injured. And like, I just needed solutions. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care where the solution comes from. And I feel that same way about my athletes. I don't care where the solution comes from. I just want them to feel good. So yeah, definitely a champion for other effective healthcare professionals that can offer good service. So, um, cool. that's important for us, but, um, yeah, pain. So how can you have pain, but not be injured? It's like the yeah. funniest thing, right? So without going too much into neuroscience and how our nervous system perceives pain, I like to think about it from the perspective of what this one statement kind of captures. And it's pain is a request for change. I say that to a lot of athletes. I've said it to you before because it helps them better appreciate why they can be in pain yet still have nothing wrong with them. And when I say wrong with them, I mean like an anatomical lesion, something that comes up on an x-ray, you can palpate. So pain is a request for change. So you've got nothing wrong with you, but the pain's still there. It's because your body is a self-preservation mechanism. Our central nervous system, which runs us, it's like our operating system, is looking out for one thing that's keeping us alive keeping us alive for the next day so we can survive, procreate, continue living on, okay? So if you're a cyclist and you're on this object that we've only invented like 100, 170 years ago, we come from a bipedal background where we're walking on land and we're sitting on this thing, some of us for two hours at a time, some of us for 10 hours at a time, depending on your event or depending on how much you're training throughout the, the week. We sit on this thing, we do repetition after repetition after repetition after repetition something's not going to begin to jive super well. It could be a, the knee not really aligned between the ankle and the hip. It could be you're tensed up so much in the neck because you're leaning over so far trying to ride arrow. I don't really, it's all the same stuff. It's your body's not super stoked on that. It's trying to let you know, hey, let's change something about it because we're developing 
excessive muscular contractions. In the case of like the neck tension, you're just holding that tension for too long. It could be the kneecap not sitting nicely in the, the groove space because your knee's chopping in because you don't have the external rotator control of your glute to keep it in place. So it's all these little micro things that are a reflection of our, say, functional inadequacies or like our functional things that aren't appropriate for the demands we have on the bike. And then those things compounding just so much. Like it, it's hilarious to think about how many pedal strokes we have or how many hours we spend on the bike. Like it's hilarious to think about. So go figure that a little minute thing ends up leading to like, dude, I, I can't pedal. My knee hurts. Or like, I can't walk. My back's blown out. Um, and, and that's why you'll see this. It's called like a, a more insidious onset. Like it's just like a vague onset where nothing was really happening. And then bang, like this one day I was riding, it hurt. Well, if you break your bone. What is that you, breaking you, point? Yeah, what is, yeah, sorry. If, so if you break your bone, you feel it right there. Something anatomically changed, so then bang, you're going to be in pain. But getting back to your point, like what changed there? If I if I knew when that point was going to happen and why it occurred, I'd probably be, you know, the best PT in the world. Not still a student, uh, two years into this whole thing. But uh, yeah, it's just a breaking point. It's just like the the straw that breaks the camel's back type of deal. And so when people have that, it's like, okay, it happened that quickly. Therefore, I can reverse it that quickly. And it's like, no, 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 no. It happened on one ride, mm. but it took 10 years to get there or two yeah. years. Yeah. I'm shaking so. my head thinking of my own story. And, That's, you know, I, I would say for any athlete out there, learn from my mistake of waiting too long. When you start to see little red flags pop up, even if it mm. doesn't affect your cycling, try to change it. And I talked to another athlete who's been on the podcast before and a much stronger athlete than me. Um, racing pro and he's had an issue and he said i'm embarrassed that i got myself to this point and we quickly consoled each other of man when it wasn't affecting the biking i ignored some red flags now that i look back and it was over a three-year period so i was like ah it's not that bad not that bad and then i was like oh i can't walk <laughs> yeah this is a problem yeah yeah okay. and it's scary too because sometimes the the performance on the bike doesn't necessarily come down like you can no. still be performing at a pretty high level on the bike and then it's like either you just get good at managing the pain while on the bike or your lack of function and pain presents off the bike when you're a normal human being. The 75% of the day you're not on the bike. So there's not always a signal of telling you that something's bad happening. So someone's listening to this and they say, okay, well, hold on. So if I'm crunching up and I have all this uh, extra stress in my back and that's messing with my nervous system, why is rest not the answer here? Shouldn't I be getting off the bike mm. and letting things chill? Well, Here's my perspective. Tim and I show his perspective. There's, there are physical therapists out there who would say rest is what you need to do. But is that really an option for an athlete who loves this as much as we do? Like, not, not really a long-term solution. Okay, so there's that aspect. The athlete's going to want to do what they want to do. Secondly, if we think about what's actually the most efficacious thing for the athlete, is it the stimulus that we're providing? Or is it the way we present the stimulus? Meaning, can we augment or modify our physical nature by way of like motor control, endurance, mm. stability, all those factors? Can we modify one of those four factors or a combination of how those four factors are not adequate for the stimulus we're providing so that when those two things meet, we're all good? So we focus a little bit here. Like you and I talk a little bit about the, the stimulus we're giving our body, but most of my time with athletes is figuring out how do I get them ready so they can do the stuff and be pain-free? So it's modifying your function to be on the bike and not be in pain. And I actually don't know if I answered that question completely perfectly there. So ask a follow-up if you need to. No, I was just going to say, so it, what I'm hearing from the first bullet point was also, because if I get off and rest, I rest for 15 days, I stop riding, everything Thank comes you. down, I feel better. I get back on the bike on day 16. By day 21, I'm back where I started most likely because I haven't changed anything. I've rested, yeah. which is great. It's going to reduce those symptoms off the bike most likely. But I'm thinking in my own case, I have all these whacked out how I was sitting, my lack of motor control. I think, would you say my endurance was fine? And maybe I had to do some range of motion a little bit, but I think it was more the stability and motor control. Am I trying to have my control. own self correct? No, you're <laughs> right. And it's funny too, because this is a fun thing to chat about with cyclists is like, yeah, your motor control was good. 
and your muscular endurance was, your muscular endurance was exceptional, but it was only exceptional in one plane of motion, which is a, a fun thing to talk about for cyclists and runners and endurance athletes alike is that we get really good at going in this front to back plane of motion. And then if you make us do like a rotation thing or do single leg balance and rotate or move side to side, we're garbage. We really are because we spend yeah. so much time going in this direction. So yeah, you were, you were needed to bring up the motor control, bring some awareness to your right side, um, unpack a little bit of like compensatory lumbar tensing up and then, yeah, we're, we're, and we're, we're still on, working on it. I mean, yeah, still, we're still working on it for those that i Try not to make this podcast about me, but for those that have followed me on Strava, it's like I'm I'm still having a hard time going super hard in racing. So I'm going to take a step back and just kind of like really focus on this. Um, okay, so that's good. I like that. So that. That's key for people to understand why just getting off the bike is not going to be the answer. So what about what can we're kind of I don't want to. I don't really ever like on a podcast, like rave, wave a red flag, be like, oh my gosh, you got to be careful. Like you're going to get injured. But what could cyclists sure. do to improve their off the bike performance and like maybe in recovery routines or stretching? So some of these things don't happen or maybe avoid some common things that you see happen. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a, you had made a comment to me like, dude, you've almost ridden 200,000 miles these types of things happen because you're in this super stiff yeah. shoe for ten, a decade and da, da 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 Like, what do you see or what, this is kind of like a huge question, but I just so that the general person listening might be able to get a pearl or a tip or yep. like get some bands and the basics. I'll try to make this one direct. So the people listening can listen to this conversation and immediately implement something into their life that will hopefully either reduce prevalence of injury and improve performance. And I would say the most important thing starts with understanding your limiting factor. Limiting factor is personal to you. It could be sleep. It could be stretching. It could be one of the four factors we talked about. But that's the most important thing. Figure out what your limiter is. And that might seem a little bit vague, but like it's the most important thing to pinpoint because you could be doing all this other advice you hear online. Like if, if you were to think about your, yourself as an athlete, you could be like, okay, I need to focus on this, 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 and that. Well, it's like, no, we just talked about your three limiters. It's motor control to your right side. It's reducing lumbar erector engagement during higher velocity or higher effort um, bike rides. And probably managing like daily training load, like something along those lines, right? Like those are the three things you need to focus on. So I think everyone should be kind of a little bit more cognizant. Okay, what's my limiter here? What's my limiter? Okay. Now, into more tangible things, establishing a daily mobility routine is so crucial. It allows you to check in with yourself every single day. There's not a day that goes by where you're like, oh, shucks, I didn't realize my hamstrings were getting tight. It's like, oh, shucks, I didn't realize my, my neck muscles were really pissed off today. It's like, no, a daily check-in where you're not only reducing some, some tightness we get from being in a pretty scrunched up position on the bike all day, but you're also checking in with yourself, monitoring how things are progressing, giving yourself more accurate feedback of how you're responding to training and, and what the bike's doing to you. And then another thing would be if you fall in a camp where you really haven't spent a lot of time in the gym and maybe you're someone who doesn't have a fantastic feel for that conversation we were having earlier, which is like the mind muscle connection piece, work on establishing a pre-ride activation session. And it can be short. I'm talking five, it could be two minutes. Step one right. would be chuck a band around your knees, get down into a squat position. So your knees are at 45 degree angle, pivot up onto one toe and externally rotate or like drive your knee away from the other knee. You should feel the muscles on the side of your hip working. Like that would be the simplest form. And that's so important because those muscles on the side of your hips are controlling. It's not the only thing controlling, but it's contributing to the control of your knee as it travels up and down in the pedal stroke. So I would say find your limiting factor, establish establish a, a daily mobility routine to check in with yourself and just work on the natural tightness that occurs with being a cyclist. And three, establish a pre ride activation exercise you can use to make yourself feel better when you get on the bike. And if I may, 
I think it's important to unpack why period activation is so important because a lot of people like in the strength and conditioning world like to clown on, like feel your glutes or do the band stuff. Like, oh, it has to be a squat. You're not getting strong unless it's a squat or it's a pistol squat, which is heavy load. And I'm like, great. I think that's, there's a lot of merit to that. You want to make sure you're training the athlete to become strong so they can meet the demands of their sport. But don't throw out bands because of this thing. Cyclists sit on bikes and bikes have saddles. That saddle is in many ways sending a neurological input to your brain. That like I'm being supported. I don't have to utilize these muscles that hold me up for stability, like your, mm. your, your glutes, your core, all these things. It's saying like, hey, you can relax. You're sitting on your, your lazy boy and you've got pedals and handles to hold on to. So establishing the period activation routine allows you to get some motor control, some mind muscle connection to these glutes that naturally for many of us want to turn on as soon as we, excuse me, turn off as soon as we sit down on the saddle and begin to pedal. So for those that need that motor control increase, it's really effective for that. And I'll be the, I don't know if it's the guinea pig, it's the whatever, the, the yeah. person that made the mistake. I mean, I used to do way more lateral and lunge work. And I used to, when I wasn't, I mean, I've been pretty obsessed with cycling for a while, but I was still, I was playing like basketball. So doing slides and doing a lot of things in the winter in Rochester. Heck yeah. So this is back pre-2016. I think all of those activities were helping me avoid this problem. And then when I really ramped things up, when I moved to Tennessee, it was when I went from, let's say, 650 hours to 800 to then 1,000. And I got into the camp of more strength, get stronger, big lifts only, da, da, da. And I admit, my band work and all the little things, I stopped playing basketball, that stuff went to the wayside. And now I've found myself kind of wishing I never had done that. But um, sure. what's for daily mobility routine? I think some people are like, eh, don't need that. Can you go in on that a little bit? And do you guys have a routine anywhere? Because I don't even know, like, if I hadn't talked to you, I'd be like, well, I don't even know what I should, what, what do I do? Yeah. If I don't have a routine, I'll film a reel and I'll make it on Instagram and we'll put it out there for the people. Maybe we can collab on it. That'd be cool. But um, That'd be awesome. I think the five things I think about when it comes to the just bread and butter, simple mobility routine you need, let's work on a little bit of spinal flexion and extension in rotation because we're not getting a lot of that sitting on the saddle all day. So two movements I like for that are called the foam roll T-spine inhaler. And that's where you lay on the foam roller. You kind of work in between the spinal vertebra. That way you're not right on the bony part and you work on extending your back over the foam roller and breathing in through each extension. You can look up these videos on YouTube. They don't have to be for me. They're, they're pretty common exercises. The most important thing is just doing the darn things. So you've got foam roll inhalers, and then open the book for thoracic rotation and kind of like some lumbar rotation stuff. And I remember when I first started working with Tim, I started doing the routine. I was like, you're having me do, you're having me do back rotation stuff for this? Like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, why am I doing this for knee pain? And it's because we need it to be functional human beings. And a lot of us aren't, even though we're really good cyclists. It feels good. And if you think about all of your back muscles being more calmed down and like your vertebra and joints moving better, your nerves exit by way of all of those joints and muscles around the back like that's that's like the highway they travel through and then they branch out from right so if those segments are moving better and everything back there is working better then all of your innervation and mind muscle connection is going to be improved from those two simple things so get yourself a foam roller 36 inch long do you open the book foam roll t-spine okay great then let's do three stretches i like couch stretch because it addresses your anterior chain, both your quads and your hip flexors. I like like a pigeon pose or a piriformis stretch to get your external rotators of your hip. It also gets anterior chain too because your back leg has to be so straightened out. And then the third one would be half pike hamstring. It's like one leg straight, one leg's bent by your side, you're folding over, it addresses hamstrings and, and uh, your adductors as well. So between those three stretches, you're getting some fantastic kind of full body um, stretching and just keep it simple with that. I wish I could like do demo or like sort of a video overlay for this stuff. It'd be so good. <laughs> that we need a, do you ever listen to Joe Rogan? We need like a Jamie, like, yes, we do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure that out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I'm on yeah. it. Okay. I've thought of that uh, so many times. Like uh, we need somebody here. Okay. Then you had brought up a bullet point of 
why can the solution to your injury also be the answer to your performance limitation? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it's Going interesting. on that. And it's why it's, it's kind of like, okay, am I a coach or am I a, a PT? Where, where are we at here? Are we addressing pain? Or are we addressing performance? And it's, it's awesome that it's both usually. It's so both. And it goes back to this idea of what's your limiting factor? So for an athlete who's presenting to me with some type of discomfort on the bike, their limiter isn't pushing more watts. The limiter is get me out of pain so I can push more watts. Mm -hmm. So the thing that's going to prevent you from being in pain is obviously the thing that's going to mean so you can just train more frequently, hit the workouts, yada, yada, yada. Like we can all imagine that being out of pain is great for just consistency in a sport where consistency kills. It's the most important thing potentially. Um, but then if you think about it more acutely, like what if the thing causing your pain, which in some cases would be inadequate stability of your, your hip joint, which is kind of controlled, influenced by your, your lower abdominals and your glute muscles. Okay. Well, what if we just improve the stability and mind muscle connection of these massive muscles? Well, that's going to lead to a lot more power output on the bike. A, you're just recruiting more motor fibers. So like you're essentially adding a, I'm not a car guy, but like you're just putting a bigger engine in your car, right? You're utilizing more of the available space and muscles on your body to generate power. And then two, you're redistributing the load. Like if an athlete comes to me and they're like, oh, my quads are just shot when I'm doing tempo. I'm like, tempo? We shouldn't even really be tapping into quads there. That's like a, a posterior chain, lots of hamstring, lots of glute just turning the pedals over and really cleanly driving that power when it's below threshold. And so when you're not having to tap into these muscles that fatigue more quickly, then that's also going to improve your performance as well. So it's a very fine line. Like the thing that's going to get you injured or make you feel in pain, if you address that, will never make the pain come about, but it's also probably going to make you perform better because you're more efficient in all those other factors that are going to make you pedal smoother on a bike. I never said this to you after Carter County road race, Stephen Bassett won, Jimmy Sherman yeah. came, in and I came in third. And the biggest thing in the break yeah. was we were pegging it over these climbs and we only had like two and a half minutes to the bottom of it, it ends on a seven mile climb. And anyways, the, the thing that resonated that you're just saying is when I would peel off from pulling, I was like, oh my God, I'm in such pain. Like, and that's when I needed to be recovering. But mentally I was like trying to physically recover from what I had just pedaled. And so there almost felt like there was no recovery. Then I was like, I was back to pulling. It was just, it was terrible. And so yeah. exactly what you're saying, how eliminating that I thought of, okay, next year if I can go to that race and I'm actually recovering when I should be recovering, I'll be able to contribute so much more. It was just, it was like a living hell. And you know, I think a lot of, I should, maybe I shouldn't say a lot of cyclists. There are so many cyclists with pain. I mean, I've sent three athletes to you that have been like, dude, my, my back is just always like hour three, my back, you know, Seth went and won marathon masters Nats. Charlie won a local big gravel yeah. race. And I see these text messages to you of how excited they are. And like, if you are in pain and I don't, I don't know what your guys' business model is exactly, but it's like at least reach out to Scout and be like, "Yo, am I a candidate to work with you guys?" Because it's, it's going to change your life. I mean, and the thing too about, and sorry to go on a rant here, but you know the band work, I noticed my body changing from that. You know, and you ha you guys have really good core stuff also. That has been another big aspect of riding. I think I was okay with core, but not specifically. But like, man, my hips are stronger. And when I don't have pain and I can actually drive, it's like, oh, man, there is almost like another gear in here. Not to go back yeah. to car analogies. But yeah, so definitely don't poo poo on the bands. And yeah, that was a good that, that's a good. Uh, yeah, topic we, we, like... we got to get you to a point where you're rolling off the brake and you're you're sinking down to like, you know. I don't know what 320 something still hard but it's not it's not killing you first off that yeah. pain's not there but then also that's somewhat of an efficient like five seconds for you or whatever because if you've ever ridden in a break the brake's miserable the whole time if, if it's yeah. going hard but it's like you need to find the least miserable part because that's the only thing you're going to get and so exactly. if you're in pain during that point then it's like whew. so that's that was a, that was a nice ride by you that day 
We got. We'll, we'll get it, was it better. Good, man, I was motivated with. I uh, love racing with Jimmy Sherman. He's a beast and just a great dude. And I was, yeah, hoping we could maybe, maybe stay away. I didn't think I was happy with third. I thought for sure more people would catch us, but okay. So the last bullet is. And is this related to pillars of function? You would put down four pillars of being a high performing injury free cyclist. Are these different than the ones you kind of brought up before for the endurance, motor control, stability, strength, range of motion? They're they're a little bit different. And these are things I learned directly from Tim Wu. So I'm speaking a lot about the stuff that he's already created and I've been a, a vessel of like information exchange. So don't get it twisted. Tim's the guy who came up with a lot of this stuff, and I'm lucky enough shout to share it. Shout out to Dr. Wu. Yeah, shout out Dr. Wu. Um, we've talked about it a little bit. So the four pillars are different than the four aspects of human function. Just to reiterate, the four aspects of the human function that we try to parse out as being adequate or inadequate would be stability, motor control, endurance, and range of motion. Okay. Now, four pillars of being a high-performance injury-free cyclist – is more about what you do in your day-to-day life that allows you to get ready for the race, kick ass or kick butt and not get injured. So that would be your daily activity, your, excuse me, your daily mobility routine. So you need to have some form of daily mobility routine. You don't floss on certain days of the week, right? You floss every single day. It's good for you. Same thing with your, your simple mobility routine, pre-ride activation, have a pre-ride activation routine you get. That way you're not the guy driving three hours to a gravel race, walking out of their car and hopping on the bike and, and letting it rip. Like you think any other high performance athlete in the world, like Kobe Bryant, Tom Brady would walk out of their car and then expect to go rip it like that. No, like chuck on the band for five minutes. So daily mobility, pre activation, know your limiters. That's the third one. Know your limiting factor, whatever it may be. It could be sleep. It could be, you've got this, weird neurological issue with your foot muscle. I don't know. Like it could be super, super personal to you. And the fourth thing is standards. So we like to have a rough idea for what we would want a competitive cyclist or a cyclist who's trying to ride their bike often to be able to do for a breadth of movements that we have. So for example, like you want to be able to make sure you can do this movement for this many reps for this duration whatever it may be, before you're kind of expecting yourself to be able to perform at your top level. And that concept isn't unique to us. Like if you think about a, a return to run protocol, if someone's injured, other PTs have their own version of this. It's like you need to do 30 body weight heel raises before I trust you to go run. For us, it's kind of like we want to make sure you're at this level, at this kind of complexity of a movement or difficulty of a movement before we really expect you to be to be ripping it. And that's not just because we think it's cool to be able to do 20 full range of motion lunges with 15% of your body weight in each hand. We do it because it's a tool for you. Because if you get to that point where you've knocked all the standards out and you're good, if you ever deviate away from them, whether you're conscious of it or unconscious of it, and you start feeling a little bit poorly, you can go check in with yourself and like go do that movement and see, oh, shucks, I'm like 50% off what I used to be able to do when I was ripping. Mm -hmm. So get back to that level. So that's why I like the way we do our virtual coaching is that hopefully if we do it well, we get to a point where the athlete is their own independent kind of like, you know, I don't want to say PT, but they know what they need to do to take care of themselves. They can be in charge of their journey and and totally have the information they need to always be ripping it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a really empowering thing for them because it's as simple as, not doing a habit, being like, oh crap, I, I was kind of slacking, then getting back to the stuff you've already gone through and prove to yourself you can do. Going out riding, see how it changes, checking in with your limiting factor, okay, is this being addressed? And, and people usually get back to where they need to be. So um, as cyclists, we, yeah, we, we like to miss out on the little details every single day sometimes, like when it comes to off the bike stuff, we're really good about having our computer charged and having our fresh kit on, having the cool Strava comment. But sometimes we don't just like, chuck a band around our knees dude cyclists will spend like thousands of dollars on every single saddle in the entire world and they'll they won't just get on the mat and like do some core for 15 minutes a day so oh. if, if anyone if anyone says if anyone gets anything from this conversation i hope it's like the willingness to work on themselves off the bike before expecting all their on the bike stuff to be fixed my man i think 
and maybe maybe not every athlete, but many of my athletes will know I'm constantly preaching the little things. And I think yeah. one of the best comments that has always resonated with me, I'm a big fan of respiratory training. I think we're going to learn a lot more about this. And a guy said to me, well, man, if respiratory training works, why is everybody not doing it? I said, because you know what? Everybody's not going to take 10 minutes and breathe after they go for a three-hour ride. Period. Darn straight. There's a lot Powerful. of other things going on. People are doing working nine to five jobs and they got this and they got kids and da, da. they, you know, you got to pick and choose, but the little, I think the tidbit there too, is like, fine. Like you said, you kind of become your own guide of what's moving the needle the most. You can't do everything. And, um, I think that's been the thing that I've really liked about the virtual aspect is I can do all of this on a yoga mat, get some bands. It's a low investment. I was going to the gym and now it's like I bought those other next level bands and I ordered some dumbbells. Like, man, if I can do this twice a week at home and not even have to save 35 minutes driving there and back from the gym, now I'm creating more time. So I think that was a huge piece as well. But absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like, man, Brendan is really, he's drank the glue dober Kool Aid, but it's, it you'll get the changed. check later. <laughs> <laughs> it has changed me. It has changed three of my close athletes. I know there's more. There's other people that I, I've put planted the seed. I said, hey, you should at least reach out and just talk to them. And um, we'll see. But it's, yeah, it's been amazing. And I'm just so, I just wish I knew about it earlier. You know, you made a comment to me before of, I think I could have a lot of people set more sprint PRs if they start working on their glutes than big squats. And I was on the fence. And now I'm like, oh, damn, now I see what he's talking about yeah just yeah driving yeah because sometimes what? it's Go it's and just to just to complete that thought that way people aren't because it's always tricky when you put out little tidbits of information online like if it's not a complete thing then they can I, take it so i love just doing like, that i do that all the time yeah yeah people go crazy <laughs> that's my biggest fear it's like it's a bad never, never mind uh but <laughs> I, my i love this saying i got it from tim you can't fire a cannon from a canoe you need to make what? sure you're, you cannot fire. A, does that make sense or no? I guess. Cause the canoe would tip over. Exactly. Like, so if you're, if your body, the thing you're trying to unleash a sprint from with your legs is a canoe, meaning you got a flabby core and you're not super strong in your glutes and hips. And you're trying to push all the weight you can push. Like you're a leg press guy. You can put all the weight on the leg press and just push like a thousand pound leg press, but your core is not, uh, at the same level as this leg power that you have, you're not going to be able to express it. You're just not. Cause where's like the stability going to come from that you're trying to push all that power through your legs going to, going to go to. So that's why you got to have that, that strong core and glutes for, for the big sprints. Would you agree? Another analogy to that is like someone who has a big sprint, but they can't make it to the finish to use a sprint. So it's like, you're working on the wrong, why are you always doing sprint workouts? You never yeah. even get to use it. It's so, what final this was awesome man because i i really want to just have an intro for people to understand what you guys are doing and the effect i mean just the the motor control aspect to me was so surprised when you started talking about this i i i didn't know what to expect but it has been way more in depth than i thought and we've really kind of just scratched the surface with this so any final closing words of like not even tips for athletes, just like, you know, people that you hear that have back pain, knee pain, hip pain. Um, mm, yeah. Like, and that, my last question will be, how, what's the best way for them to contact you? Like Instagram, do you want email? Like, it's just so they have a question to get more more knowledge from you on it. Sure. Um, the one thing I'd like to impart to athletes who have pain right now is that it's not forever. Even if it feels like the situation you're going through right now is just is the worst thing in the world respect that honor it view it as how much love you have for the sport and how much you want to be back out there it's real but it's not forever you can change it i don't care if you have osteoarthritis in your hip you've got a five inch leg length discrepancy i don't know if a perfect solution exists but a better situation from where you're currently at right now exists okay that's kind of like a broad thing but i just want to inspire like there's hope out there for anyone with a bunch of pain you can get through it and a better situation exists. Okay. Um, and then what that entails, I mean, that could be, that could be very different. Maybe it's not my service. I'm not the perfect PT or coach for every athlete out there. Um, I think we work for a lot of different people, but it's, I'm not the perfect thing for everyone. 
But I do think people can improve their situation regardless of what weird thing they have going on in their lives. Um, okay. Last thing would be, yeah, you can reach out to me on Instagram. Um, I'm at Glutoper Coach. Um, you can reach out to Tim. He's Glutoper Doc. Uh, so yeah, reach out to us there. We love to connect with people and there's nothing better than figuring out you can help someone do more of what they love. So that's what fires us up and we're going to keep doing it. Hell yes. And uh, I'm going to encourage you guys to keep putting out the tips that you guys used to put out reels and all those things. They're yeah. super <laughs> informative. And I realize you guys have a few other things going on besides, you know, making Instagram posts, but yeah. um, everybody hit them up on Instagram. Uh, definitely reach out. If you have pain, just get a conversation started. Don't keep riding with pain. It sucks. Sure. And like you said, you can get rid of it. So Thank you so much for coming on and chatting about this super just, I think it's just good knowledge for people to have, even for down the road, like in two years, they're like, oh man, you I remember hearing that podcast. Maybe I should hit somebody up. So, all right, man, well, hopefully we cross paths in a race ride. And uh, until then, I will talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you, Brendan. Peace. Thank you.